All right, there we are, right at the top of the hour. Welcome to tonight's session, Recession Proof. And if you didn't realize that Scott Landers and I were stock market profits before this very moment, then perhaps you have connected the dots that we have had this training in the works now for probably about a week and a half. Scott and I started talking about it. And I said, I, I see what's coming and I think we need to do a little training around this. And we thought about charging for it and we decided this really needs to get out to as many people as possible. So this is a, this is a free series. In fact, we're gonna publish it up on YouTube. Perhaps you're watching this on YouTube, we welcome you. But in case you missed it because you rushed home from work and immediately logged into the Zoom webinar and didn't take a look at the stock market today, we officially closed in bear market territory on the S&P 500. And I would like to say that we timed it to the day with when recession proof uh, training is starting. And, and, and we did. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> we, we saw it coming. And there was a few things we were waiting for some confirmations on, and it, it just worked out perfectly, and there's a lot of buzz around it. So we have amazing attendance here live tonight. I guess it takes a good bear market to freak everybody out and get them here. I don't want you to freak out, and we're going to talk about that specifically this evening. Let's first get the disclaimer out of the way as we uh, embark upon this journey. I need to remind you that the training is for educational purposes only. All examples and analysis are intended for these purposes and should not be considered as specific investment or trading advice. Uh, we're going to share results. In fact, I've got the TSU trading account uh, for June coming up here in just a couple slides. I don't want you to think that you know a three-day mini series and, and a good bottle of Coke is gonna help you trade the stock market exactly the way that Scott and I do. There's a lot of experience, there's a lot of wisdom. Uh, there's just a lot of scars that have gone into creating the kind of traders that we are today. And I don't wanna, I don't wanna remotely mislead anybody and have you think that you're gonna magically duplicate that. However, I do think that success leaves clues and if you model what successful people are doing in front of you, you can significantly shorten your learning curve and get closer to the outcome that you desire. So over the next three days, you are going to learn how to thrive in an economy that makes most other that takes most others out of the game. I personally have traded through two recessions. One I actively traded through, that was the recession of 2008. One I sat on the sidelines, that was the pandemic of 2020 because I didn't know what was going to happen. And the good news is it ended rather quickly and we found the bottom and we were up and running. It almost seemed like no time at all. We were so busy doing other stuff. It was kind of like, whoa, that, that, that recession went by fast. Uh, Scott, I believe, and he'll share a little bit, he'll share a lot more about this with you tomorrow night. Uh, Scott has traded through three recessions, the two that I mentioned, and then the recession prior to the 2008 crash as well. So there's a lot of experience in the room. And if you've not gone through one of these as an active trader, they're a little bit different. They're tricky. And we've got to make some adjustments to the way that we're approaching the stock market if we stand a chance of surviving and thriving in this environment. So this is the blueprint that we're gonna follow over the next three days. The first day is gonna be working on what we have to do to analyze a bearish market correctly. If all you've ever experienced is a bullish market, you better rethink a few things. The second day, tomorrow, same time, same place, it's gonna be all about strategizing. And Scott's gonna to bring to you guys a, a system for analyzing and strategizing how to place trades in a bearish market condition. And then on the third day, I'm gonna be back doing the, prime, the, the bulk of the training and we're gonna talk about monetizing, or as I like to call it, your paydays on purpose. Analyze, strategize, monetize so you can achieve a payday on purpose because I believe, and it's at the bottom here, this is the heart of everything we do at TradeSmart. We need to do a heart check anytime we dive into this. Why are we doing it? And the answer is because I believe with all my heart that when good people have more money, they can do even more good things. I don't really believe that we're going to get into an environment where, you know, you're going to need to be taking food to your neighbors. I think that's a little bit more hype than actuality right now. And all my conspiracy theorists said, nope, you see what's coming. I get it. Like, okay, be prepared, but don't be crazy. 
So I don't know that we're going to get there, but I do know that as people are hurting, going through what looks to be an imminent recession, many very smart minds agree on that fact, that as you do well in the stock market, you're able to do good with your neighbor or in your life or with your kiddos. As you do well, you're able to do good. That's my heart be here. I hope you guys will take this. I hope you'll pass it on. I hope you'll help your other dabbling trader friends that uh, didn't show up tonight be able to get this information in their system so they can put cash in their jeans. I really want to challenge you. Choose commitment right now over convenience. I know it's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You got dinner. You got kids in bed. You got what Jeopardy? I don't even know what's on TV. There could be a lot of reasons why you leave early or you don't come tomorrow or you don't come Wednesday. I'll watch the recording, which you won't. I told the team this morning in our staff meeting, I don't even want to give the recording because people just keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off until eventually it's just forgotten. Right now, choose commitment over convenience. I can promise you that no good thing in my life came because I took the convenient route to get there. I promise you guys, if you will commit to three days, three evenings, three hours with Scott and I, we're going to give you some tools that are going to help you navigate these coming months and help you put massive stacks of cash in your jeans. Today, what I want to talk about is finding the opportunity in the calamity. You can do this. There's a lot of fear that's out there right now. I'm reading reports from the stock market to the real estate market. People are starting to freak out. That's a hallmark of a beginning bearish trend. I also want to discover the necessary framework to make money in a recessionary market, a contracting economic market. And then we're going to talk a little bit about how we can prepare for the imminent coming economic storm. If you are new to Trade Smart, which most of you should have been around for a little while, but very briefly about me and my experience here. I've trained over 300,000 people at TSU over the last 13 years. That number seems staggering to me. I feel like it's been two years, but it's been 13 years, 2009. Interesting timing, wasn't that? In 2009 is when we started teaching people publicly. Uh, the ages have ranged from kiddos to 80 years old. For those of you that have been in some of the foundations of trading classes, you've met Josiah. He's my 12 year old. He is actively trading the market and kicking my royal behind, mostly because he has no fear of loss. He's like, well, dad will put more money in my account, which I've never had to do. He really does a great job. So he's 12. If a 12 year old can do it, you can do it. We've also had students all the way up to 80 years old and beyond. We had a sweet man once who enrolled in one of our classes and his wife emailed us and said, he's over 90. And if he doesn't make it until the end of the class, can I get a refund? Yes, of course. You can have a refund on your course. Sweet man, he made it to the end and he loved every minute of it. I've worked with accounts that have $1,500 in them and I've worked with accounts or people that have accounts with $1.5 million in them. Uh, this one happened to be a very personal and close friend of mine. He sold his business for $60 million. That was a tough payday. And uh, he just, he loved trading. He thought it kept his mind sharp. He, he liked staying up on uh, the economy. And so he put 1.5 million in a discretionary trading account and he traded it like a boss. He was amazing at it. His name was Dave. I'm also on the cutting edge of trading artificial intelligence. This is a very near and dear project to my heart. Uh, my eldest son, Caden, who's uh, now a legal adult, he actually innovated this way back in 2017, used it to win all kinds of trading competitions and make a bunch of cash and we brought it to market in 2019. And it's one of the only artificial intelligence services that is even accessible to retail traders. So we like to say we make nerdy things simple and easy to use. And then last but not least, I am the manager of the public TSU trading account. Now, I don't often pull this out. I guess they say, it, you know, it's not bragging if you can do it. So, you know, it can be used for good, it can be used for not. But I just wanted to show you guys, if there's any question about the level of experience that I have or that Scott has going through these challenging economic conditions. Of course, you know the market's basically gone down since January with a little uptick. 
This is June's month to date performance on the account. And it reads a little bit backwards here. So you can see that um, on June 6th, I bought to open 42.75. This was the morning glory strategy, by the way. We legged out half, halfway to target. We legged out the other half here. This accumulated one R profit in our target, in our uh, account. Uh, very same day, we sold short. Is this the same day? Hold on. Uh, nope, that's the second leg out. Here's the second trade. I was going to say, I don't think I did two in that day. Uh, this is the eighth. So two days later, we bought to open 40 shares of SSO. We sold to close. This equaled, actually, this one was about 0.75 R cash in our jeans because I pulled the trigger a little bit earlier. And actually, this was good because this is the day the market started to swan dive. So we got out just, we almost top ticked that day. Got out just in time. Here's another one. This is our third trade of the month. We sold short TXN. I just closed this trade today, the 13th. Uh, this netted me 2R on the Texas Instruments trade. And then Micron as well. We sold short same day, exited it today as well. Another 2R cash in our jeans. So all total, we're up 2, 4, 5, about 5.7R going into the midpoint of the month. That's not a bad month when the whole market is selling off and freaking out. And if you wonder, how the heck did they know? In case you didn't notice, Scott's gonna laugh right now. You know what I'm gonna say. It's 100% win-loss ratio. It started off as a joke, because uh, I'm a little bit addicted to the win-loss ratio. I kind of love it. I think mostly because y'all judge me on a win-loss ratio and I don't like to be judged. We'll take that, 100%. <laughs> I had 100% last month too. Uh, they're not always 100%, but you know, both bullish, both bearish, all of that. How do we figure that out? The answer is we felt the bicycle balance underneath us before. So I offer this as an encouragement to you guys and hopefully as a validation to pay attention to what we say here because I think you're going to find it serves you and your trading as well. Ponder this thought with me for just a moment here. The life that you are living today is the result of your decisions that you made three months ago, 90 days ago. Think about that. The way that you're trading today is a result of some decisions that you made 30 days ago or 90 days ago, three months ago to get the training or not get the training to build the muscle of disciplined trading systems or to trade willy nilly. The corollary to this is also true. The decisions that you're making right now are going to determine how successful you are in September. If you're happy with your financial situation, great. If you're not happy with your financial situation, change something. If you're not happy with your trading performance, change something. And if you don't change something immediately, the world is changing on your behalf. We've talked about this from time to time, economic seasons. It's hard to think this. We just hit record highs today in Nashville. Heat index was 109. My sweet wife was at the zoo with the kiddos and she melted because she's so sweet. All right, it's 109 outside, but economically speaking, winter is coming. I can't sound that alarm loud enough. Winter is coming. And if you're a Southern boy, Southern family like we are, Whenever there's a hint of a winter storm coming in the south, everybody goes to the store and prepares bread, milk. <laughs> Why those are the two things people buy, I don't know, but it's gone. I mean, it's like a supply chain crisis every time the winter storm comes here to Nashville, Tennessee. My friends, there's an economic winter coming, and that's going to necessitate that each and every one of us makes some changes. How are you going to change? Because what you did 90 days ago is not gonna be successful 90 days from now. Let's take a look at what recessions look like on the chart here. And just to be clear, we're not technically in a recession yet. A recession, there's a few ways you can define it. Uh, the most popular way and the way that the news media is most likely to define it is two consecutive quarters of GDP that contract, negative GDP. We already put one in the books for Q1. 
if we have negative GDP in Q2, what's going to happen is they will say we have been in a recession since January. All right, so it's it's rearward looking. So if you're all like, well, geez, it felt like we were kind of in a recession. That might be validating to some extent, like you've been living through a recession. Look how great you're doing. <laughs> you're, you're halfway there. If we somehow squeak out a positive GDP, most collective smart minds, I'm not talking about the CNBC minds, they're stupid. But the, the economists that I know and trust are saying all signs are pointing to a recessionary period in 2023. It's coming, my friends. If it doesn't come, thank God. I'm glad. It hurts me to see retirement accounts shrinking. It hurts me to see people losing their jobs. It hurts me to see businesses going out of business. But by the way, recessions don't put businesses out of business. Recessions simply illuminate the businesses that were weak, that they didn't have the systems and structure in place to survive an economic winter storm. And the same is true in trading. The recession is going to wipe out the people the traders who have not prepared to trade this kind of an environment. So this is a chart of the set of the recession since 1980. It's a logarithmic chart. You can see some of them are super short, like the two month recession uh, from COVID. Some of them are rather short. I believe this is um, just one quarter long in the late, actually I think this is 1980. Then in 81, we went into another recession right away. Uh, I believe these were both eight month recessions here. And then, of course, we have the Great Recession that many of you guys remember in 2000, late 2007 going into 2008. Now, notice something interesting on this chart. With relatively few exceptions, most of these recessions are either during or slightly after the beginning of a bearish trend. There's one notable exception here. I believe that was Black Monday when we had the huge sell-off period. End of thought. All these other major turndowns came as a result of, or not as a result of, but in conjunction with the recession. So let's take a look at what this feels like. That was a monthly chart, by the way. These are back to daily charts. Here's January 1980 through July 1986 months. This is how it looked and felt. Boom. I want you to start queuing these up because we need to build this muscle memory so that we know kind of what to expect going forward. We went right into a second recession like you saw on the, the previous slide, July 1981 to November 1982. This was a 16-month recession, a year and a half, just under a year and a half. Bearish trend the whole way. But I want you to start noticing this. It happened on the last slide. I didn't point it out. I'll point it out on this one. The market found the bottom before the recession realized it was over. This is going to be a challenge that we need to overcome. One of them. We've got a couple others. Finding that bottom, right? And I can promise you right here, right where the circle and the arrows are pointing, that's when the news media is going to be at its most fevered pitch. This will feel like Armageddon. We went through it in 2008. We went through it again during the pandemic. All hell is going to be breaking loose right here. And the market's going to be forward looking saying, oh, actually, I think we're coming out of this. Here's another example. <clears throat> These are all in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, by the way. July 1990 to March 1991. I remember this one. I wasn't old enough to trade it. I was in middle school, early high school in the season of my life. <clears throat> trade it on down. Look at what happened. This is a hallmark. Okay, we're in the middle of recession. The media, you can imagine, media is freaking out right now. And the market's like, okay, we're up, up, and away. This was an eight-month recession. Now we're really getting into um, seasons that I remember. 2001, March to November. I probably was dabbling in the market at this point. Uh, I was just graduating college. I got married in 2001 to my sweet wife, Jen. Again, though. This one was a little bit unique. We found a bottom here. So this would have felt like we were coming up out of the bearish trend, but this bearish trend actually lasted quite a while. It's sort of like the recession just participated in the bearish trend party starting in 2000 and going well into 2002. Then of course, the one that everybody here remembers and is likening current events to, and we're gonna take a look at that. December 2007 to June 2009, an 18 month recession 
This is looking a lot more like current events to me. Different economic setup-ish. I did some research on many of these recessions. I should have written the number down. Maybe I'll have that for you all tomorrow. But the number of recessions that had some part to do with oil is staggering. Look it up. Uh, Wikipedia was actually a pretty good resource for this. Just kind of laying out some of the major triggers to recessions. And you can fact check that with other services like I did. And you'll find that the price of oil oftentimes kicked the company into these recessions. Because it doesn't just bother you at the gas pump, which it does. Right? When I got to swipe my card twice to fill up our expedition, that's a problem. It's also a problem if you're filling up dump trucks. If you're filling up delivery trucks. Trying to get food to the groceries. Or trying to run a tractor on a farm. Their fuel costs have skyrocketed. That's why the cost of everything is going up. Costs more to farm the food. Costs more to deliver the food. Costs more to keep the food cold. Right? Oil is 100% playing into these inflationary, the inflationary economy that we're having, much like it did in 2007, 2009. Now, of course, the big news here was this was the, uh, the bank collapse, the economic collapse, and then the auto industry collapse as well drove us in here. But again, look what happened. It wasn't after the recession. It was in the middle of the recession, middle to back quarter of the recession. We found the bottom and the market took off. Keep building this muscle, plant those seeds. Like, yes, this is that. That's what the picture looks like. Here's the last one. This is the COVID crash. I mean, I think you had to be a genius like Stephen Padley to trade through this. He tripled his account. Three, he showed me, he three X his account through this crash. I'm like, I was not that smart. Uh, I just got out here and <laughs> ducked for cover like everybody else did. I, mean, I don't know what's going on. I've never lived through a global pandemic before. But then, of course, we hit the bottom. The market was forward looking. It bottomed out before the recession was over. And then we jumped into one of the greatest bull markets. And here we are, current events. Doesn't this, though, and we're going to look at this in real time, I'm telling you, just look at this chart pattern. Look at where the recession was starting. Doesn't that look a lot like this? And if we have a recession that starts about here, Sure does look a lot like that picture from 2007. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not, I'm not saying this is that. I'm just saying sometimes patterns kind of, well, let me say that better. Sometimes melodies can sound the same. I'm messing up metaphors. Words can rhyme. They can be different words, but they can rhyme. I'm trying to get to rhyme. <laughs> it might sound different, but it sure does rhyme. That's the bad news. I really want you guys to anchor this. When economic seasons change, it creates opportunity. It might not feel like it to you right now, and I'm speaking even broader than the stock market. There's extraordinary opportunity in the stock market right now, but even more so beyond that, there are opportunities that you haven't even started to think about. Take a journey with me back to 2008. Market is crashing. Airbnb launches. And I'm not saying you got to be the genius that launched Airbnb. That seems even intimidating to me. And I love business. But you know what? My house, I could put it on the Airbnb market and start generating revenue when I'm not down in Florida, right? We can do short term rentals to start generating revenue off from this. An entire new marketplace was formed. The little guys could compete with the hotels in the hospitality industry. And you say, but Josh, I didn't have a house. Okay, do you have a car? I can almost guarantee that if you're on this webinar tonight, you probably have a car at your disposal. In 2008, Uber was launched and people figured out either because they didn't have a job or they needed extra cash from their, that beyond their job, that they could go drive around. Some people even liked it, driving around, hanging out with people and they could put some cash in their jeans. There's opportunity. Uber, by the way, also launched as a business in 2008. 2020, just a few couple short years ago, anybody with a Zoom account could turn into an internet millionaire. You have a zone of genius. You have a subject matter that you can be an authority on, even if it's just being an entertainer and bringing joy to people's lives. And you can make money doing it. 
Zoom itself is a platform. They didn't launch in 2020, but they achieved world domination in 2020. And they created a platform for anybody with a, with a little bit of ingenuity and drive to make money. And then also in 2020, many of y'all have heard this story. Josiah, my 12 year old, he decided he needed some extra cash. Nobody told him we were in the middle of a recession. He said, you know what? We got some uh, lumber, some wood out back that I could go and split and add value to people's lives. They got tired of paying $25 at the grocery store for five little sticks. He says, I'll tell you what, I will split, deliver, and stack a rick of wood for a hundred bucks. You want to know how much money Josiah made in 2020 when the whole world was collapsing and everybody was freaked the heck out? $10,000. He was... 10 years old, nine turning 10 years old at the time. Because he put an ad up on Facebook Marketplace. Here it is on a bumper sticker, my friends. When a free market economy contracts, it's a natural redistribution of wealth. Don't read something I didn't say in there. I am not a fan of people taking my money and handing it out to other people because they think it's a good idea. I'll be the most generous person in the world, but let me determine where that goes. So I don't think the government needs to be doing this, but I think in a free market economy, when a recession hits, it's a natural redistribution of wealth. Don't look at a recession as something to freak out as. Look at the recession as a reset button. We've got to understand this going into it, y'all, because if you trade like your life depends on it and you're freaked, you're not going to get the result that you want. But if you trade and I don't know if this is a term, y'all tell me like, I feel like there's a term called the apple basket upset or the apple car upset. Like, is that a thing? Like type yes in if that's a thing or type what it should be if it's not a thing, right? It's just, I guess I grew up saying it, but you know, I imagine like all the, the apple cart hits a bump and all the apples go flying up in the air and everything gets all shifted around. That's what's happening in our economy right now. We are humming along at 100 miles an hour, getting ready to smash into a speed bump. In the institutions, all the cash is about to go up in the air. And the question is, what does that now make possible for you? What does it make possible for you? You see, the institutions can't pivot on a dime. The institutions can't go out and innovate new systems and strategies to take advantage of this new paradigm that we're in. That's what Airbnb did. It created a paradigm shift. Hotel? No way. I'd rather stay in somebody's house. Like, who thought that was a good idea in 2006? In 2008, it's a genius idea. Or, I'm not going to hire a taxi. I'm going to go drive around with a stranger who could probably murder me. (laughs) Who thought that was a good idea in 2006? Everybody thought it was a great idea in 2008. The recession is going to create a paradigm shift and it's going to create opportunity. That opportunity is in the stock market. We're going to get there. I haven't looked at the comments, but probably like, when is he going to get to the content? This is the content, my friends. Opportunity is on the horizon. As stock traders, here's how we use this opportunity to put cash in our jeans. Y'all with me? Type a one in if you're with me. Upset the apple cart. Yes, thank you. Who was that? Sorties. I can always count on sorties. Okay, good. Y'all have good energy. I'm, I am fired up, ready to go. I feel super passionately about this. I'm going to share my whole story on Wednesday. Some of you know bits and pieces of it, but I'm going to share my story on Wednesday, y'all. But 2008 saved my, I don't know if I should say saved my life. It saved my financial life. I am grateful to the recession. I am grateful to the stock market. In 2008, six going into 2007 i thought i was going to have to file bankruptcy and by 2014 i was a millionaire i'll connect those dots on wednesday shameless plug to bring you back it was because of a paradigm shift by the way here's how we put cash in our jeans trading if you've been around trade smart for any time in the last two years you've heard us talking about the ultimate trading formula. I took what's probably 150 different things that you need to know to make money trading. And I I got frustrated one day trying to teach a friend of mine. And I said, it's just as simple as one, two, three. 
One, you need to be able to predict the direction that a security is going to move. It's called forecasting and it's a combination of skill and creativity. The second thing you need to do in the ultimate trading formula is be able to apply the right strategy at the right time. And a winning strategy includes an opportunity, a coordinated set of actions, and protection against a failed outcome. And the third thing you need to do is apply relentless risk management. I'm, I may change this because I like purpose-driven payday here better. Nobody likes courses on risk management, but if you, if you tell them it's a course on how to get rich, everybody will sign up for that. And then it's a bait and switch. You're like, <laughs> surprise, it's all on risk management. Y'all, all of the greats, Richard Dennis, um, oh, I'm blanking on the other guy's name, um, I'm, 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 1980s, Livermore, Jesse Livermore. Um, all of them say, Paul Tudor Jones, Risk management is where the real wealth is created. So if you manage the risk, it's, if you manage the risk, the profit will tend to take care of itself. There it is on the bumper sticker. If you manage the risk, the profit will take care of itself. So my question for you is, most of you, with the exception of COVID, and that was so short-lived, I doubt we really made much progress. Most of you started your training at least 2009 or beyond. Did anybody in here successfully trade through 2007, 2008? Because that's the last time we really experienced a prolonged bearish market combined with a recession. And the reason that Scott and I felt so passionately about getting this course out and in your hands right now for free is because the systems and strategies you've used to predict a direction, to put cash in your jeans and manage your risk during a bull market are not going to be the systems that get you to the finish line in a bear market. It's much different, y'all. And we don't teach bear market strategies specifically because they only come around like once every 10 years. And I, I mean, I could have done without this one too. Like we could have kept on going bullish and everybody would have been happy. I'm not talking about drawdowns pullbacks in the market. I'm talking about 18 month bear cycles. God forbid we go into that, but if we do, let's at least be prepared. So here's what you need to do to forecast a bearish market. First of all, and, and Scott, I know you're kind of sitting on the sidelines here through the content, but if, if you've got opinions on um, any of this, we're gonna go do a bunch of examples. Scott's gonna chime in as well. You know, feel free to cut me off um, you know, with your experience. I didn't run these slides by Scott. So, you know, maybe he'll learn something too. Wouldn't that be cool if I taught Scott something instead of him always teaching me stuff? <laughs> <laughs> A bear market always begins with denial, your denial, the, the, um, the collective holes de denial. And inexperienced traders are going to lose trading capital on whipsaws as they continue to buy the dips. This is the 2007 crash right here. So, you know, you don't know any of this exists. You know, imagine this in your mind. And so the market, which had been going so strong for so long, right, pulls back a little bit. What do people do? Buy the dip. Oop, we came down the lower. What do you do? Buy the dip. And then you get geniuses out there like, oh, this is an ABC retracement pattern. You know, <clears throat> Elliott Wave. And, uh, sorry, that's rude. I shouldn't do that. But seriously, uh, you know, and, and they're expecting it to just take off. And so every time we come down here, they're buying the dip. They might even be applying the son of Benacci strategy right there. Terribly, but they might be doing it. And so you're already at the beginning of this whole thing. You're feeling the sting of those whipsaws just draining you like the death of a thousand cuts. Anybody experience that in here? Don't raise your hand. You don't have to admit. As the bear market starts to gain more certainty in its direction, the volatility and average true range is going to expand. What does that mean for you? It means that if you were setting stops, let's say you even get into this thing bearish. You're like, great, we're going bearish. And let's say you've got a stop system that's uh, one half ATR, in this case, it'd be above uh, a 20 EMA, you know, whatever, that's a system, there's variations of this. That's not gonna work. You're gonna get, you're gonna keep getting whipsawed out of trade. It's gonna be like, 
Ah! Uh, I got in the trade, got kicked out, and it went exactly in the direction I thought it was going to go. That's succumbing to volatility and average true range. Moves can be parabolic and unsustainable for extended periods of time. A very interesting read is the Turtle Traders by uh, Denison was the original trainer, Koval, Koval, Michael Koval, I think his name was, the author of the book. Talked about how Richard Dennis trained these 23 retail traders, you and me, all different walks of life, from restaurant managers to lawyers. I mean, all different walks of life. He trained these people um, to, to trade his fortune. He kind of, it didn't start off as a case study, but it became a case study for nature versus nurture. Like, are we just born to be great traders or can you learn this? And what he taught them was a trend following system. And a lot of what they were trading was in the futures market. Richard Dennison was a famous futures market. And there's protocols in the future market that if prices go parabolic, they limit out for a day. They're limited out. And so if you get a really bearish day on corn futures and then another bearish day on corn futures, you know, and they would say the lingo is you've got two days that limit it out, two consecutive limit days, limit bear days. Richard Dennison was like, great, go in and sell short right here. It's contrary to conventional wisdom where we'd be saying, well, let's wait for a, a retracement to the mean here. Like, let's wait for it to pull back and then we'll sell short. Jesse's like, no, not Jesse, Richard Dennison said, um, you got to trade in the direction the momentum's going because it might not come back. It may be gone. I think Richard Dennis is the one that said the, ra the market can stay irrational longer than you can stay solvent. You've just got to know that. What does that mean for your trades? If you miss the move, you miss the move. You can go try chasing it. That's a possibility. It also should inform how long you're willing to stay in those parabolic trends. Let's continue on. Bottoms are often sudden and difficult to time. I didn't go look at this. If we have time at the end of class, we can. But just by memory, I think every one of those recession bottoms was a V bottom. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. I think they all look like this. Boom. No, like, you know, triple bottom, finding support. You know, Price has memory. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> Price does have memory. I'm sure it happens at a at a support zone right but it's it's gonna come just that fast and what's that gonna do you're gonna be like sweet i got this bearish thing figured out i'm making money hand over fist and next thing you know it's gonna go up it's gonna change on the dime and i told you before i'll tell you again right here this bottom is gonna come when the news media is most freaked out i would this would be an interesting study too to go look at what the news reports were in i think it was march of 2009 where we found the bottom right here just go Go do a little study on that. A new bullish trend is going to seem poorly timed and show up when the public sentiment is extremely negative. Now, one of the reasons this is an amazing opportunity, there's an adage in the market that the, the bulls take the stairs and the bears take the elevator. You can get to where you're going a lot faster in an elevator than taking the stairs. It's a little bit more of a direct route. At the same time, the strategy that took us up the stairs, you all know, you know these beautiful charts, they look like this, you're like, oh, stochastic, it's crossing up through 20, Fibonacci retracement, like, I just go buy shares and sell covered calls on them and everything is wonderful. It's not going to work, right? In a bull market, unless you're really a reckless trader, it's not that hard to make money. I mean, I don't want to be disrespectful to people struggling to make money on a bullish market. Like, I, we may have some additional training we need to do, but geez, oh, Pete, like, it's not hard to find a stock that's in a bullish trend and just buy those shares. And if you want to apply some additional strategies, you could do covered calls or whatever. We, we get in our own way because we try to get all fancy, fancy like Applebee's. That's a song, by the way. Um, but generally speaking, making money in a bull market is not that hard. Making money in a bear market, woo. That one's a little bit more sophisticated. Here's what you're going to notice is changing with your analysis. First of all, 
things that will become less effective include, but are not limited to, mean reversions. Y'all know, and we just taught this like two weeks ago in Foundations of Trading. We've got the um, the training I do on the, the rubber band or the moving average, right? And we draw this and I put the box around it and I'm like, you know, you get up here and it's gonna snap back to the moving average and yep, that's all well and true in a bullish trend. In a bearish trend, I'm not gonna say it doesn't exist, but it doesn't exist to the same certainty that it will in its bullish counterpart. Also, Bollinger Band containment. You guys have heard me say dozens of times when price action gets outside the Bollinger Band, it's probably gonna get pulled back in, right? It's like in a bullish trend, it's like having a, a disrespectful nine-year-old, right? Price action gets outside the Bollinger Band going down and you're like, whoa, come back. And it's like, nope, and it runs the other, it runs exactly in the direction you told it not to go. Right? It may end up coming back in the Bollinger Band, but the directional analysis is not going to change. If it was heading down, it's still heading down, and the Bollinger Band is just going to be like, well, we're going to get wider to contain it. Also less effective is going to be your oversold momentum. So you guys have seen um, the stochastic oscillator for sure. right? And we'd say when stochastic gets below 20, right it typically pops back up and then what do we say it could stay overbought for quite some time this is the picture you're used to seeing you've seen that so many times that it's anchored in your mind but what you're not realizing is this is going to exactly reverse and now we're going to hang out down here and the opposite is going to be true i don't really teach it like that because again you know we're going to be good for six, maybe 12 more months if it's a really long recession. And then we're going to be back to the bull market that everybody loves to trade. But for the next few months, be careful. Oversold momentum can stay oversold momentum. Now, that's what doesn't work. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. There's some tools that we have that become even more effective. Geometric analysis and Fibonacci analysis are the bomb. How many of y'all were in group coaching on Thursday? And you saw Stock the Profit Landers nearly in real time for, forecast when and where the market breakdown was going to happen. I have good news for you. If you didn't happen to catch it in the live Zoom, it's on YouTube. Go look it up. Whatever last Thursday was, that's when we did it. And it was probably, I don't know, half to midway through. When, when was it, Scott? I forget. Just scan. That's about right. Yeah, that's about right. Half to three quarters of the way through. Scott's literally, you know, he's drawn his box around here. This is geometric analysis. And we got the price action that's going in here. And he's like, I'm telling you all, if it breaks bearish, it's going to go. I don't know why I drew seven. Let's go with seven. It's going to go here. And it's going to go here, and it's really not got a lot, lot left to hold it before it goes down. And what happened, right? It went to here, and then it went to here, and then my phone went ring, ring, and it was Scott bragging on the other side. Can you believe that? What kind of a friend does that? Brags about how, how <laughs> no, we had a good laugh over it. it. Nearly prophetic. Go watch it. It's on YouTube, last Thursday's live stream. How did he know that was going to happen? Geometric analysis. Fibonacci analysis is another way to analyze that as well. I'm going to take a look at that this evening. Linear regressions. I'm not as much of a pro on this as Scott is. He and I were talking about it. I'm like, hmm, let me go try some uh, linear regression analysis on previous um, uh, recessions and bear market analysis. I'm like, I'll be darned. That works very well. Scott has an entire turnkey trading system based on linear regressions that he has given proprietary access to hedge funds using. Y'all, it'd be very, very smart of you to model what the big boys are doing because they know what's coming and they know how to prepare for it. Linear regression is a great tool. And then calendar ranges. Now, drum roll please. Scott's going to be taking all night tomorrow night and sharing with you guys how to use calendar ranges to effectively forecast in these current market conditions. Everybody said, woo, woo, right? It's new for a lot of you guys. It was brand new for me uh, back in January. I think it was the first time Scott taught it. I'm like, this is genius. 
and it's just the constellations have lined up. We've got this bear market starting. We've got the recession that's imminent, whether it starts this quarter or starts in 2023 is yet to be seen. But Scott and I talked and we agreed it makes a lot of sense to just share this whole system and strategy with you guys. So that's tomorrow night. Come back and learn all about calendar ranges. <clears throat> Pivot points might be disregarded by volatile price action. What I mean by this is, so we're trading on up and we come down and you guys know I make fun. Actually, I don't make fun. I think it's genius. Nobody can make fun of this. Price has memory. I, I did trade market though, Scott. So you were a little slow to the, you should have done that before I got to it. Um, so we've identified these pivot points and what you're used to is the market will kind of come and consolidate and it's like, it's like, do you, do you want to go back up? I don't know. Do you want to go back up? I don't know. Do you want to go back up? I don't, let's try it down. Okay. No, we'll down. And so the market consolidates around these pivot points and then it's polite and it goes back up or it does whatever in a bear market context. No, it comes down. It's like, bam, peace out. It'll blow straight through your points of support or resistance. You need to understand that from the perspective of stop placement, right? So if you're hoping that it's gonna come up here and kind of do that little song and dance, nope, it can shoot right through it parabolically. And you also know, need to know that on your targeting as well. You might not wanna just exit at a pivot point because by golly, it may just blow on through and keep on going. Also, bearish gaps are less likely to fill immediately. So we're heading on down and then candlestick gaps like this. So you've got an open day gap. It could continue on. It, it could be months before that gap fills. I did not trade the morning glory strategy through the 2008 crash. I didn't know about it back then. Hadn't, um, hadn't invented that thing yet or adopted it, I guess. It's kind of a, an amalgamation of a lot of things I've learned. It would be an interesting thing to go test. I don't know if we can get that kind of pre-market volatility, but I'm going to walk out on a limb and say the morning glory is going to be less effective for an indeterminate amount of time. I don't know that it's not effective, but I'm going to be very cautious with it because these gaps, it's more what Alfonso calls the gaps and goes. And last but not least, y'all, this is so important. I don't know if you even realize how significant this bullet point is. Perfectly timing swings is going to be difficult and should not be your outcome. Perfectly timing swings is difficult and should not be your outcome. I know, oops, let me go back. <clears throat> I know you guys are used to this. These beautiful strategies, you get a Fibonacci retracement. We put the box in there. We say as long as it trades two or within, although that is still effective. So I should, I'm gonna abandon that analogy, right? But we get these pivot points dialed in. We got the, we got the stochastic crossing up through 20. And you're like, you know, I can get in like right here. It's gonna be a lot harder during a bearish move to time those pivots correctly. So I saw it, um, this was a, uh, uh, training that Richard Dennis did, the original, the OG turtle, or the teacher of the turtles, I guess, right? So in their model of the world, let me do this from a bearish context, oops. In their systems that they were working on with traders, and I'm not trying to read anything more, oops, I misjudged this. I'm not trying to read anything more into this other than they didn't catch major portions of the move. Their delta was right there. They just scooped those up all day long. Now, this is probably much larger than you're willing to stomach because what would often happen in these trend following systems, ah, I can't believe I just did that. Too many keys, okay? What would happen is they would start getting in here, right? And they sit through all that loss. Now we're break even, okay? Now we're heading on down and they necessarily would wait for the bottom and it starts up and they would get out here. So again, that's their takeaway, but they gave up all of this back here. If you guys are addicted to the top tick or the bottom tick, it's not gonna work. 
you've got to build a different system that gives you an edge. If I could sum up trading through a bear market, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. You're going to need to have wider stops. I'm not saying take on additional risk. We'll cover that in class three. But you're going to need to have wider stops to accommodate volatility. You're going to need to stay in the trends longer than you feel is really reasonable because it goes parabolic. You're going to need to be comfortable with letting it come down and bounce off the bottom and come back up. And you can't look at this as lost profit. The alternative is you end up getting out you know, way early in this trend. You've got to get uncomfortable or you got to get comfortable with being uncomfortable Wednesday. So tomorrow's all strategy with Scott Wednesday. We're going to talk about practical ways to manage your risk because I'm not saying go out and be risky. I don't think you should risk more than 2% of your account, possibly 1% of your account, because while maybe it doesn't seem exciting to miss the very top or miss the very bottom, this in here is large and in charge. It goes fast and far. You can get two, three, four, probably not 234, two, three, four R in this one trade and it can happen in a week or two. Boom, done. So you can put massive stacks of cash in your jeans. You're just not going to get the very top and the very bottom tick. It's a different style of trading. So what I want to do, and we actually took longer to get through this than I thought. I want to... Go to trading view. Y'all good? Is anybody going to leave here at the top of the hour? So like I should go through homework and then come back to this. Doing okay? Good. Justin, good. Richard, good to see you. Keep on trucking. Justin, I don't recognize your name. That doesn't mean you haven't been around. It's more a commentary on my memory than anything else. But are you new with us? I mean, not that I remember all, however many thousands of people's names there are. Okay, so there's a tool in TradingView called the Bar Replay. You know, I'm, I'm not a spokesman for TradingView. I just like it. I use it. I love that it's HTML. Uh, if you're on Thinkorswim, I think there's a similar tool. You could ask Chris Burgess. If you're on TD Ameritrade, I think there's a similar tool. You could ask Scott. I use TradingView. So you push this sucker and it goes back in time. So one of the things I want to point out to you guys before we go too far, let's do this. If we grab the little measuring tool, again, look at this pattern. Are you seeing this, Scott? Like this just, I don't know. I may not be the smartest guy in the room, but I can see patterns that look similar. Yes, I see it. Head and shoulders pattern, showing up everywhere. Testing of the head and shoulders pattern, parabolic crash. Hello. And... Um, coming to my measuring tool from the top I'll go with the top close I don't know that matters this is the Dow by the way to the bottom we're down on the Dow 17% so the Dow's not made it an official bear territory but the S&P has and trust me if it's not already it's that's gonna be all over the news and it took exactly 110 looks like 110 bars 160 actual calendar days to get there okay now, with that information in hand, 17%, 110 days. Let's go back to 2007. The gray box on the screen is the recession, beginning and ending. That's kind of conventional nomenclature. If you read any uh, economic briefings, they highlight recessions and gray bars. I don't know who started that trend, but anyway. So from the top here, let's get a little more granular. So from the top, let's go 100. 10 bars, boom, there you go. And the low that we achieved in that time frame, I'll be darn, look at that. Okay, 17%, 110 bars. And let me zoom out so we can see this. And to me, these patterns are shockingly, shockingly similar. And this is kind of a new story for me. I've been saying all along, this is not that, this is not that. And it's true. The, the situation that has set up this, this chart pattern, this economy, is completely different. 
you know, mortgage defaults, bank defaults versus supply chain crisis and oil. But the pattern is similar. And I have a theory on this that I'm not going to go into because we got too long or we got not enough time. So I'm just postulating that it's possible, you know, they're going to say potentially if we have Q2 um, decline in GDP, they're going to say, oh, we've been in a recession and, you know, who knows how long it'll go. This one went 18 months right here. So what we can do with this tool that we have is, and I'm going to get rid of the gray box because I don't want to be cheating. I put them all in a folder so I could do this. Y'all are going to be shocked. So let's put it right about here because this kind of feels like where we're at right now. So now this is like we're trading the Dow in real time. By the way, I didn't put this in here, and maybe Scott will talk about it. It's more of a strategic concept than anything, but it's not a terrible idea to just trade ETFs on the indices because it will help reduce a little bit of the crazy volatility. So if you're not comfortable or not used to the volatility, an ETF on the Dow or the S&P is going to be a little bit smoother than Apple. Okay, so now we said things like... Um, um, not standard deviation was it um what is it scott regression linear regression thank you linear regressions are helpful and fibonacci analysis are helpful let's see if we can put a linear regression channel on here i mean i'm talking out my bum right now scott's going to be a real pro that's going to teach you guys how to um how to do this but i thought it was very interesting to me and i'm like i'll be darned doesn't take a genius to take a look at what's happening here. So we got that. Let's add some little Fibonacci targeting on here. Uh, get my little tool set. So I could see us. In fact, we probably did. If you go back and look at some trade smart recordings, like we would draw a box here and be like, trade two or within, but not above this green box. And we're going to head on down. Okay, where are we headed down to? Well, um, somewhere in this channel is not a terrible idea. We could also do this. I call it my ABC tool, probably this one here. That's basically measuring this range. Might should have, we're gonna have to work into this a little bit, but I'm projecting it down from here. Let's see where it goes. You're going to be doing this on your homework. You may repeat this exercise several times on the same stock. I want you to the best of your ability, feel the emotion of what, what this is like watching it develop in real time it's amazing how our minds work i mean you guys know like what's happening like it's it's going down but when you back it up like this it's it's you know, just watch it's very interesting all right oh that's pretty cool came down bottom of the linear regression channel right to my fibonacci target and essentially uh a hammer here so I would kind of be inclined to be like, okay, it went up. But look how parabolic this move was. So if you were looking at this too, by the way, and it just sold off whatever that was on that day, 3%. This is a 3% down day. Followed up with another probably percent. Yeah, about a percent. Came on down. Boom, it bounced up. Now I'm thinking that we're heading up. Let's get a couple days on here. Look at that. This is what I'm telling you guys. Do you see, this is almost like textbook. Came down and now we're starting to head on back up. We didn't catch the bottom tick. And guess what? The linear regression channel just kept on heading on down, heading on down. Now we did get a couple updates. Let's see how far up it could go. Geometric analysis. Let's go back and measure this move right there. And I would estimate that we come to somewhere in this box. Let's see if we get up that high. It's interesting, we got right to the channel. Gonna make it, there you go. Now we're right to our box here. Now, you know, I don't know if we're making it up here, I don't know if we're making it up here. I'm recalibrating my thinking. Again, I'm bearish on this thing, because we're sitting kind of like where we are at current events, we're seeing this thing break down. Trade two or within, but not above this green box, we're still bearish. I may enter my bearish position right here, because this thing could go like this tomorrow knowing that it might look more like this or even look like this, right? So my stop probably needs to be up here somewhere. Let's see how this goes. 
That one worked out pretty nicely for me. Took a minute. There you go. See? See this right here? That's what will show up. This is a, it looks insignificant here because we're zoomed out. But if you did this in real life, this is a, almost a 3% down day. What was today in the market? Was it a 3% down day? It's about the same as today in the market. Today, everybody's freaked out. You look at this, like, oh, kind of down a little bit. No, it's, that's a huge day in the, in the, um, in the Dow. Now, how far down are we going to go? Okay. We got a couple options. We got our linear regression channel, which is working pretty nicely. If nothing else, it's showing us we're heading down. That's helpful. Let's do our ABC tool. There's actually a real name for this tool, but ABC feels good. You know, it's interesting. If we kind of got down in here or here, let's see what happens. Look at that. Boom, boom. This is a, a Marabozu. Is that right? Not Marabozu. Um, tweezer. This is a tweezer top right there, if you can call it that. Not really in an uptrend. Just slamming back and forth, back and forth. Look, boom. Did you see that? Straight to target. Boom, straight to target. Look at that. Look at that. I mean, even Scott was impressed by that. He's not saying it, but he really is. See what I'm talking about here, guys? The analysis is not impossible. And this is what you've been watching Scott and I do. You've just got to start adjusting your strategy to compensate for some of these differences. Let's take a look at what's not helpful right now. What do we say? Stochastic. Look at this. This is exactly what we shared with you guys. Stochastic comes up. Boom. Slams down. Okay. Boom. Slams on down. Let's go on a little further. See how this works. Let's do an inverse strategy. Let's see if we can get stochastic above. Look at that. I mean, y'all, when have you seen stochastic hang out below... 50% for any period of time. Let's see if we can get it above 80. All right. I'm going to just be a contrarian here and say that this is probably a bearish signal. Right? And if we want to be super nerdy, uh, where might it go? Yeah, somewhere there. Somewhere in those three green lines and we could either wait to cross down or just go contrarian, go bearish right now. I'm going to go bearish. <laughs> nice. I'm a genius. Look at that. Look at that. Is this helping you guys? I know it's a lot of me doing, and I don't know a better way. I guess we could do like a group coaching. You guys could walk through it. Type a one in if you're seeing some differences. If you even saw one difference between... The way that you're used to analyzing versus what's happening here. Uh, we'll send you guys a notebook of this. I did not export it. Y'all don't know this, but it was... This class has been interesting because I had a heart to teach what we're teaching. But in unusual fashion, because I'm usually very much worked ahead. Kind of came together at the last minute. I'm like, this is what they need to hear. Like, strip out all... Like, this is what they need to hear right now. So I didn't get the notebook off to... Rebecca fast enough, but we'll, we will get it sent out to you so you can take all my notes. Hey, honey, it's great to see you. I saw that you're, you're Traction Pro, and I am super excited for you. Congratulations on that. Eight o'clock. Y'all good? Hey, let's do this. Because some people are going to choose convenience over commitment, and they're going to need to leave. And I understand that. But I want to connect these dots here. This is starting to bridge a gap. We talked about alterations that need to be made in your analysis. And that was just the Dow. We need to do it on stocks. And I'm going to have some homework for you guys to, to figure that out. We need to now answer the question, so what? How does that need to inform our trading decisions? You guys have heard Alfonso talk about an edge in your system. 
Here's five questions that I think you really need to sit down by the end of the week and answer. And if you can't answer them, you need to get some coaching on, on how to best answer them. The first question that will help you define the edge of your system, how do you determine what security to buy or sell at any given time? You show up, you're... The world is your oyster. You could trade any stock, any ETF, any future for that matter, any foreign currency pair. How do you know what the best security is to buy or sell at any given time? Second question, how do you know how much of that security to buy? How do you determine what the size of your position is? Third question, what condition or setup triggers the buy or the sell? And I'll take it a step further and say, if you can't put this on a napkin, it's too complicated. One of the things that I've learned, I've been fascinated this year, maybe it was just the Lord's favor. I've been fascinated reading some of the, the granddaddies in our industry. Richard Dennis is one of them. I keep talking about him because I'm in that Turtle Traders book. It's a genius book. If y'all want to be encouraged and edified, go get the Turtle Traders book. Do it on Audible. It's a great listen. And hear the story about how Richard Dennis, is it Dennis or Dennison? I'm questioning myself now. How he took a group of 23 normal, everyday Joes and taught them how to trade his fortune. I think the most successful one generated $30 million in profit for him. Their deal was they got to keep 10% of it, so that wasn't a bad payday, All right? They talk about, the giants in these books talk about how simple Trump's complicated every single time. Problem is we get bored as humans. We want to make it complicated. Just keep it simple. Scott's a master of this. Although looking at his charts, you might not know that sometimes. Sorry, brother. I love you. <laughs> I had to get that dig in. <clears throat> so I, I, I exited a position today based on Scott's um, post that he put in discord the monthly chart of the spy trading right to support like bang right on support and i'm like hmm i could see it bouncing there yeah i think i'm gonna just i'm gonna put the cash in my jeans and be done so that was thanks to scott y'all think that discord is for you it's really for me so i can pick the like pick the brains of scott and chris and alfonso and all those people here's your fourth question how does your your system determine when to exit losing positions. If you don't know that going into it, you're sure as heck not going to figure that out when you're in the middle of the trade. And the corollary is, how's your system determine when to exit winning positions? I would implore you not to place another trade until you have answers to all five of these questions. If you need help with those answers, reach out to us, let us know. We've got coaching and mentorships and masterminds and things that you can do. These systems are completely designed and laid out for you. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You just need to raise your hand and ask for help. It's so far beyond the scope of what we could teach in 60 or even 90 minutes, but we have that available for you. If you have the answers to these questions, great. The next step is what needs to change if we're going into a bearish market. Have I tested my system in bearish market conditions? Go back to 2007. COVID's weird. I don't think I would try to test my system in the COVID crash. I mean, I'm telling you, I just peaced out. I remember my birthday was March 3rd, 2020. I exited my last position because I was excited to go celebrate my birthday with the family. I didn't want to be thinking about the trades all day. And then like all hell broke loose in the stock market. And I was like, I'll just come back in April. May, <laughs> see you guys. Yeah, that's a true story. Gregory, that's awesome. Richard Dennis is a smart dude. Very smart dude. Here's some action steps, and then we'll do some Q&A. I can go do some more um, practical examples on the charts for you guys if you want. Number one, identify and notate the last six recessions on your chart. I want you to see it with your eyes. We're conflating two things, a bearish market and a recessionary economy. They oftentimes go together. They're not required to go together, but they oftentimes go together. And if we're like, 
y'all, so we had negative GDP Q1. They're saying at best, we might have 0.9% growth GDP in Q2. And that number keeps shrinking by like the day. Yeah, I keep seeing the forecasts come out. Um, I think we could look and see that we've been in a recession for six months. So go see how that looks previously. Put, a, put the little square boxes. Mark up your chart. Second, observe how the market behaved pre, during, and post-recession. Pre, during, and post-recession. Build that muscle of seeing how the price action moved. Third, using a replay tool, practice forecasting. I would do the Dow and the S&P. I mean, overachievers, you can do the Qs. Uh, I forget how far back the Qs go. I don't remember when that index hit the market, but you know, you'll, you may run out of data. Uh, but the Dow will go back the furthest. The S&P, I think, is the second furthest. Don't fact check me on that. I don't go look at 1930s data very often. I would, I would do a soft cut at World War II um, or even in the 70s. I kind of have a, a guiding principle that if I wasn't around during that you know, period of time, it's probably not important. Now, I know that we probably have 18-year-olds and 12-year-olds in here, so you, you probably need to go back and study the 80s. But us old people... Um, we, we don't need to go back, you know, to the 1930s depression. That's not practical for today's stock market. Next, using the same replay tool, practice forecasting at least one stock from each sector. You say, well, Josh, there's a lot of homework. I got to mark the recessions. I got to look at the Dow and the S&P. I got to go find a stock from each sector. Yes. Yes, you do. And when would now be the right time to do it? Or get up early in the morning. I don't care. Choose commitment over convenience. The decisions that you're making today are going to affect how much cash you have in your jeans in September. I promise you. Lastly, start thinking through the five questions defining your systematic trading edge. If you have answers, great. If you don't have answers, raise your hand. We have resources for you. All right, um, I pretty much just pushed through and taught. If there's any questions, type them in the Q&A pane. Or Scott, if you saw any fly by, you're welcome to jump in here as well. Or if you have any commentary that you want to offer. I can't hear you my headphones though. I need to change that, stand by. You sound like an alien. Really? Okay, that sounds a little better. Uh, better? sure okay now i should be able to hear you good now nope hold on stand by second place to check the old zoomer for some reason uh. all right now i should be able to hear you uh now you're now you're legitimately in my head you're in my head yep <laughs> what you got All right. Um, I see Andrew saying credit spreads can win in all three directions. Yes. I don't think credit spreads are the most profitable strategy in a bear market. They, how do I say this? It, it's, they're not unsafe because if the market is moving wildly, you know, up or down and you're managing their credit spread correctly, you have a lot of options available. And for those that don't know what a credit spread is, it's, a, it's an advanced trading strategy. And I, Andy, I know you love them and I know you're great at them. And I, there's something to be said for playing your game. I, I advocate for that strongly. However, the more likely exponential profitable strategy are going to be long calls and long puts. That's just the volatile nature of where it's going. If you can overcome the implied volatility, that's the big that's the big if. There's some nuances with options during volatile markets that can make them tricky, but that's my good, same experience, yep. Uh, how do you add two-year yield and a 10-year yield trading view at the same time? Well, you do, what are those tickers? you have to tell me. Is it, um, it's like U-S-T, what's the... T 
10 was, is that it, Jay? The 10 micro, 10 yield. I mean, y'all are smarter than me. I just keep it. So you do that, and then you put a, a slash, and then you do, what is it, you want a two-year, two-year T-notes. That's what you wanted, isn't it? Treasuries. Anyway, that's, that's how you would do it, is you put a slash in there, which didn't actually show up on my screen. Let me do it on something I know how to do. So like, if you wanted to do, say, um, Micron versus um, XLK, That's the, um, what do they call that? That's the, what do they call that? Ratio, comparison, spread. Chris Burgess does these in his sleep. He's a genius on this. Um, oh, Scott got his camera on? I can't see him. Hold on. Look at you. We're both wearing nice shirts. Wow. My camera's dark. Hold on, I can fix that. I look like Casper the ghost here. September. That's technically November, but in September we go on a camping trip in Wyoming and that begins the process. So how are we doing here? Hey, amazing attendance. How can I serve you guys? Do you want to see more analysis? So we can kind of break this down into either looking at, um, you know, analysis or I don't want to go too deep into strategy because that's, uh, Scott's going to cover that tomorrow. He's going to do a great job. He's consistently beaten the S and P 500 index. Okay. I believe you. Um, TLT, oh, is that the treasury note? Yeah, that's getting closer, except there's one for 10 year. I've looked this up before, because 10 year is basically the mortgage rate, isn't it? Huh. That's cool. My wife gave me a super meaningful present once. It was all of the historical stocks from the Monopoly game. Actually, they were bonds, I guess, from the railroads. And it was, like, amazingly beautifully framed. She had it all done. She had found originals, not like, you know, whatever, knockoffs. They're not that hard. I mean, they made thousands, hundreds of thousands of these things. But anyway, um, yeah, it was amazing. And then it was in my office, and a dump truck ran through my office, and then it was gone. Have I, ever told, have I ever told you that story? Oh, dude. I don't think they meant to, but yeah, true story. Anybody in here remember that? That was 2000, that would have been 2013. Lynn remembers it. Joe remembers it, yep. yep. T-Y, that's it. I remember that now. Yes, thank you. Well... Hold on. I spoke too soon. I don't understand bonds and all that. I just trade stocks. Of course you did. <laughs> um... Is this on here? Oh, that must have been a lingering. Oh yeah, it was. Hold on, I'll find a picture. Talk amongst yourselves. Let me see if there's any real questions before I go do that.
Dude, that's good. <laughs> it's a miracle I'm always right this is my office down here yep I just uh well there was a huge hill over here and my theory is the driver would help out hop out of the truck and help put the the um garbage cans in the back and he missed the air brake as he was like hopping out and it like gained all this steam and crashed through the house so some, some of y'all remember Shane Warren uh, he's still a good friend of TSU. He was a graphic designer, web developer for us, went on and started his own company. So, yay, Shane. Um, but this was his very first day of work at TradeSmart. And so Sean Buckhalter and I had left and gone out back to welcome Shane. And the garbage truck crashed through the office. And the people that were upstairs, that they, they were gone on vacation. And it was like... And the driver, I mean, like, nobody died. It was a miracle. But then we had to find a new office. So, anyway, yeah. Somewhere on the floor here is my my Monopoly bonds. It is realistic if you trade ours, I think. This is what liberated me from that. i am got this on my other page. Let me see if I can pull this up. So... Yeah, here's why this picture is important to me. Probably breaking all kinds of rules, but George is in heaven now. So George uh, McIntyre, with his sweet daughter Gracie, was Delaney's guitar teacher. He's on, if you like country music at all, especially like bluegrass, Chet Aiken style, I guarantee he's on every record. He's just, he was an amazing guitarist. I think he was one of the first COVID deaths, um, but he went to heaven before um, we knew what COVID was. Literally like, 2000, December, Christmas of 2019. The reason I bring George up is we were in a, a lesson, Delaney and I were in a lesson, and she was freaked out. If you don't know Delaney, she's very, very shy, very, um, 
it's even more so than like regular teenage girls. I shouldn't say that. I mean, maybe I'll, but it's that like insecurity. Like, what do you think of me? I guess all teenagers, girls, boys, everybody. And George had this way as a very calm, gentle human being. And he would say, Delaney, we're just playing songs. We're just playing songs. You hit a wrong string. We're just playing songs. And, you know, I guess in a way, honoring him here, um, I think about that when I'm trading. I'm just trading ours. Like, dude, why, why are you getting worked up? I'm just, I'm just trading ours. And it works, to Scott's point, it works on both sides of that equation. We can't get all excited and riled up. But at the same time, we can't be all freaked out and depressed. That will, that will ruin your trading. We're just trading ours. And, I mean, not everybody adopts the R system of, of um, trade management. It's not new to us. Actually, I didn't realize this until I started studying Richard Dennis, Dennison. I think that's the bro hammer that invented it. I didn't realize that, but I'm reading his systems and strategies and I'm like, that's ours trading. And then I think Mark Douglas trading in the zone just kind of made it clever and patented it as his. I mean, nothing's new under the sun. We all borrow each other's content, right? But um, yeah, trading, trading the R's should normalize it. And I feel like a broken record for turtle trading just because I'm listening to it in the car. But he says exactly what Scott said. Trading should be boring. Anyway, yeah. You're such a great mentor, Scott. I appreciate... Um, if y'all don't know, like Scott gets on and helps navigate his, um, we need a cool name for your people. Like turtle, like turtle traders is cool. Like traction traders. I, I feel like we could do better than that. We need a name, but Scott's, Scott's got this loyal following and, um, he like live trades these things with him. It's amazing. Um, I'm tempted to cut it off here. Y'all it's eight 30. I've had an, unbelievably long day i'm excited to say we got our nashville house in our contract today it was a little bit of a nail biter took a little bit of a took a little bit of a hit on it not too bad but um i want it out of the house i see what's coming on the economic horizon and you know i didn't flinch shaving a hundred thousand dollars off the price of the house just to be done with this thing and get it out of my portfolio because it's just not it's not great with interest rates going up um scott and i are both looking at some real estate data the um premium luxury what was it called the the high-end housing market already contracted 18 percent 18 percent is that year to date what was that stat from or is it year over year yeah probably probably year over year um anyway so yeah but that went down today under contract no contingencies cash deal why people walk around with millions of dollars in their jeans i don't know but they seemed excited to buy the house and felt like they got a good deal so <laughs> everybody's happy and i can afford i can afford to go visit scott <laughs> I, we're we stink like well, i don't A, B, C tool again. That is this one here, Jay. It should come with a warning that you need to get trained up on how to use this. I, I, Jay, I, I love you to death, brother. We don't need to add anything else to complicate your analysis. Um, I traded for years before I learned how to use that tool. So I'm, I mean this kind of heartedly. You and I have talked personally, right? We've been on a Zoom call together that tool is not going to solve your problems. This is going to solve your problems. Right here. That. If you can answer those five questions, Jay, go back and test it and show me how it's worked. That's going to that's going to solve the, the challenges. So I honor you. I honor you for being so transparent with your trades. Because there's a bunch of schmucks in here that make similar um, choices 
in their trades and they just they don't post it they only post the winning trades in discord and that's stupid like i challenge anybody to pull up their trading account i'll do it i'll i was about to say something really gross okay <laughs> like never mind <laughs> filter josh filter filter anyway um so i honor you for being transparent and by the way that accountability is going to help you grow exponentially faster but what we're struggling with is getting consistency in your system and a system that has an edge. Answer these five questions, demonstrate that it's working, then we can get into some bells and whistles with Fibonacci tricks, which are super cool. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Jay, Jay, that's a good, that's probably a good system during a bullish trend. It's not going to work in a bearish market. You need to adjust, um, so one, trending, that's good. 1% of your account is good as defined by a stop, right? Return on risk, we've talked about that. Um, the three, retracement, RSI, stochastic, MACD, etc. That needs to change. Number three needs to change. And I would recommend uh, reevaluating your, targets and that's the pot the, the target one that's the pot calling the kettle black because everything in me wants to be like yeah two percent lock you know put the wins in your jeans um you'll leave a lot of profit on the table and it won't offset some of the volatility on the losing trades so you're close scott brother it's really good to see you here um it's really good to see you here what were you saying see you, brother um, I have one more thing to share. I really hope you guys will make it tomorrow night. What Scott's going to share on calendar spreads is amazing. Oh, I remember what I was going to share. 
So here's, here's the danger, all eight of you guys that are left in here. We didn't charge for this series because it's just, a, I mean, if we were to even put $70 on this, like we'd get 25% of the people that are here. But when something's free, it can tend to also seem worthless. What was already shared tonight and what's going to be coming up tomorrow and the following day could easily be, easily be in a $10,000 mastermind. And if you guys paid $10,000 for this, then you'd be like, I'm going to really value this and get the most out of it. But then the message doesn't get out. So it's a, it's a conundrum. Scott and I have chosen to go free. Don't mistake free for worthless. There's a lot of experience. There's a lot of scars. There's a lot of opportunity in what's been shared with you guys tonight and coming tomorrow and on Wednesday. Uh, definitely come back tomorrow. Come back on Wednesday as well. I'm going to share my story on Wednesday, how 2008 made me rich, uh, how I hit millionaire status by 2014, whatever that's worth. Um, just lost a bunch of friends, really. It's all that happened with that. And... I've got a, I'm working on a little closing ceremony that I'm hoping will, will just take this thing right over the top and, and really inspire you guys. Blessings on your trades. It's going to be an exciting market. I mean, we couldn't have picked a better week to do this. Hit us up on Discord if you have access to that. I'd be glad to talk on there. Uh, info at tradesmartu.com or respond to any of our emails. There's real human beings on the other end of that. Rebecca, she's a darling. She'll pass on to us whatever needs to come get passed on to us. Blessings, everybody. Thanks for hanging out. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.